Previously on the Happy Spaceman Reviews... Resistance is futile. Wait, 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 that didn't happen. I don't remember that happening at all. What I do remember is that we talked about some of the scariest moments from movies, shows, and music videos that I watched in my childhood, so make sure to watch that video first before this one, unless you're some kind of rebel, in which case... Okay, I respect you. Fight the system. Next up, we have another TV series that was much closer to my age range when I watched it, though I'm not entirely sure how I was able to watch it. Teen Titans. I loved this show as a kid. As I said, I didn't have cable growing up, but whenever I was in a position to watch this show, like if I was at a friend's house and it happened to be on, I would. My favorite character was Raven. I don't know, there was something about her sarcasm and her utter disdain for social interaction that really spoke to me. Evil beware, we have waffles. As an adult, Teen Titans still holds up. I love the original show, except for season 5, enjoy the sequel movie Trouble in Tokyo, Hate the hell out of that god-awful Teen Titans Go series, yes, even the movie, don't add me. And I'm looking forward to the upcoming continuation of the original show they keep teasing. I hope it's good. <laughs> now, Teen Titans was kinda dark for a kid's show, and everyone who grew up on it has that one moment or episode that scared them. It's okay! You're going to be alright! For me, it was from the episode Birthmark. This episode... It's hard to describe. Every time I try to say what scared me about this one, people look at me like I'm crazy. But that's because they haven't seen it. This episode focuses on my favorite character, Raven, as she confronts the Titans' main enemy, Deathstroke. I mean Deadpool. I mean Deathstroke. I mean... Slade. It turns out it's Raven's 18th birthday, and surprise surprise, she hates birthdays as much as she hates everything else. But this time, she has a legitimate reason. Tell me what's going on. If you knew anything about the day of my birth, you'd know there's nothing to celebrate. Hmm, I think I understand. Now that you're 18, your fade fan artist will start drawing porn of you. A legitimate concern. Then they confront Slade, who is more powerful than ever. There's this cool battle between Slade and Robin on one of the sets from The Great Mouse Detective before he reveals his true motives. I have a message for you. Oh, he's become a tattoo artist. Well, that's pretty cool. I have to say, Raven, when I found out the truth, I was very impressed. All this time, I had no idea. Ron Perlman gives an incredible voice performance as Slade during this scene, during the entire episode, really. His performance, combined with the way his character is stalking this teenage girl, comes off as truly intimidating. Not to mention moments like this. As the episode progresses, it's revealed that Slade was sent by Raven's father, the demon Trigon, to torture her about her destiny to bring about the apocalypse. Which he does by... ripping her clothes off. What you have concealed, you shall become! Oh, and if you can believe it, it gets worse. Your destiny shall be fulfilled. No, but seriously, did you have to strip her clothes off? It's bad enough that you're showing her a distorted, hellish vision of the future where the world is consumed in lava and all her friends are killed, but did she have to be almost naked when this happens? I was too young when I saw this to really be familiar with the concept of rape, but even then I knew that no means no, dammit! And then, after showing her this vision, Slade proceeds to push her unconscious, half-naked body off of the top of the building. Very fun. We'll be in touch. Oh, and a happy birthday. Critics always like to claim that Teen Titans was too light and soft compared to the comic it was based on, but this episode is proof that the show still had its edge. We're going to need ice cream. You can have all the ice cream you want, it's not gonna make me forget what I just saw! You see what I mean? I can't say that this kids show contains a scene resembling rape without people looking at me like I'm crazy. Teen Titans is still a great show, but this episode was friggin' creepy. Don't worry about Raven, by the way, she's alright. Hey, what about puppetry? We've talked about a lot of stuff that was animated and live action, but I could have sworn there was a scary movie featuring puppets? Can I help you? Greetings! 
Can I enter your humble abode? What the... Oh yeah, vampires have to be invited inside, right? That is correct. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> well, Mr. Count, count this. No, 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 no. <sighs> five times. That's five times. The Dark Crystal. This is when Jim Henson, whose previous work was mostly lighthearted and child-friendly, decided to experiment a bit with a large-scale fantasy epic akin to the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. It's kind of the spiritual predecessor to Henson's later film, Labyrinth, which I actually reviewed a while back, though unfortunately that video was removed due to copyright. Now, I admit I probably won't be saying a whole lot about this movie, since I Hate Everything and The Odd Ones Out already covered it at great length in their videos. For the longest time, I didn't even remember what scared me about this movie. All I remember is that every time I'd want to watch it, this would happen. Oh, what's going on? I don't know, guys. I got some bad vibes from this. I better watch, watch Labyrinth again. I like that movie. It's not scary. Every other scene, it seems like something new appears out of the shadows to freak you out. <laughs> the Skeksis, the evil creatures, are responsible for a good number of these scenes. There's a particular Skeksis, the Chamberlain, who makes this jarring noise every scene he's in. <laughs> When the main character's land spiders are eaten by giant crab monsters, that was also pretty messed up. And I'm positive that the scene where they drain the life essence out of an innocent creature was responsible for a good amount of my fear of this movie. Even worse when it nearly happens to Kira, one of the main characters. It doesn't help that the designs of Jem and Kira look uncanny valley as heck. I think part of the scariness of this movie comes from how immersive the world is. Jim Henson and his team did amazing work in this film with the scenery, the character design, and of course the puppetry. The amount of detail put into each scene truly makes it feel like you're in an entirely different world. It's honestly a work of art. Apparently in the original cut, it was even freakier. Like the Skeksis didn't even speak English, they had their own language. <laughs> But they changed that and several other aspects of the film to make it more child-friendly, though it clearly didn't help that much. To this day, I can't entirely figure out whether I even like this movie. It's too weird and scary for most kids, yet the world doesn't really have any clearly defined rules and too many things happen with no explanation whatsoever, making it hard to totally enjoy as an adult either. All I can say is, it sure did freak me out. Also, there's a prequel series on Netflix called The Dark Crystal Age of Resistance, I haven't seen it yet, but I've heard it's pretty good. But okay, no more goofing around. We're at the top three on my list. This is where things get really scary. And while I'm at it, I might as well include number two. I adore the Fantasia movies. Fantasia was one of the first movies I remember watching, and Fantasia 2000 was the first movie I ever watched in theaters. I owned both of them on VHS, and now own them on DVD and Blu-ray. I love the hell out of the first Fantasia, and while Fantasia 2000 isn't as great, I still get a lot of enjoyment out of it. I've always believed in the power of animation and music to tell stories and convey emotions without the need of dialogue, so these movies were basically made for me. And it's only fitting that each of them would end with a good healthy dose of nightmare fuel. The final scene in the first Fantasia is set to night on Bald Mountain, and there's a devil! Satan! 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 I think his name is technically Chernabog in this, but that doesn't make him any less scary. The way the music swells every time he appears adds to this effect. He doesn't even have to do anything, really. He just reaches his hands out of the city and ghosts start rising from their graves. Is this just a regular occurrence in that city? The fact that many of these spirits are floating through a hangman's noose is something I didn't catch as a kid, but makes it even scarier now. Each of these spirits has its own unique design, which is pretty cool. This is also probably the only Disney movie you'll see that has actual nudity in it. Whoa, those are tits! Tumblr would not be happy. If the devil isn't satisfied with your dance for him, he just tosses you into the fire or crushes you in his hands. He doesn't give a shit, he's a devil. I remember reading that the devil's movements were modeled after Bela Lugosi, the original actor for Dracula, and I can definitely see it. 
I also read that his design was later the basis for Goliath from Gargoyles, which I can also see, though Goliath is definitely less intimidating. I gotta say, too, the animation is amazing, especially for 1940. The devil comes off as really menacing. Disney had cojones back then. He is eventually driven off by the sound of church bells. Not the coolest defeat, but whatever. Believe it or not, I actually think Fantasia 2000's final scene was even scarier. This one was set to the Firebird by Igor Stravinsky, which nowadays I mostly associate with the band Yes, but when I saw this movie in theaters when I was three, I obviously didn't have that frame of reference. It follows this cute nature sprite and her friend, who's an elk, or maybe a moose. Meese? I can't tell. So she's kind of just going around and creating plants and stuff when curiosity gets the better of her and she decides to go into this caldera. Oh, don't do that. Just... just get out of there. Gah! Yeah, catches you off guard, doesn't it? The build-up to this scene is great, and the way the Firebird appears legitimately still gets me today. And the song itself already comes with its own music sting. I may have mentioned before that I have hypersensitive hearing and can get startled by sudden loud noises, so when three-year-old me saw this in the theater for the first time, I apparently started crying in the middle of everybody and had to be taken outside to calm down. Fantasia 2000, baby's first jump scare. Even after that initial reveal, the tone of the segment drastically changes. The music becomes more frantic, images of skulls appear in the cloud, and the firebird... Well, in Night on Bald Mountain, the devil caused lots of chaos and destruction. Here, the firebird literally is chaos and destruction. It was born out of a friggin' volcano! As a kid who grew up around nature, seeing everything get destroyed was very upsetting to me. And it didn't help when I discovered that it was based on the real-life eruption of Mount St. Helens. Run, nature sprite! Run! Oh, thank god you're safe. Well, everything's dead. Alright, bye everybody! We had a good run! Just kidding, the elk helps the sprite bring everything back. This entire segment has some of the best animation I've ever seen in a Disney movie. The ending part has made me tear up more times than I'd like to admit. Chances are, I'm probably tearing up right now as I'm editing this video. It just goes to show the true power and beauty of animation. I also remember reading a while back that the animation in the Firebird scene was inspired by the works of Studio Ghibli and renowned anime director... Hayao Miyazaki. Yeah, about that. We've had a lot of fun looking at the other entries in this list, but finally, we're here. For as scary as all those were, there's one particular movie that tops all of them in my books. The movie that left a lasting impact on me for years. The movie that inspired me to make this video to begin with. The movie that legitimately traumatized me so much that I only just now revisited it for this video. Hayao Miyazaki's... Spirited away. Yes indeed, Spirited Away, Studio Ghibli's classic, highly acclaimed children's film, was the movie that scared me the very most as a kid. And I already know what some of you are going to say. But Space Man, it's so good! Why were you scared of it? Well, let me give you some background. In my hometown, there used to be a video rental store called Sneak Reviews. It sadly went out of business in 2015, but it was different from most rental stores in that it specialized largely in obscure, indie, and foreign films that were otherwise not available. This is how my dad first found out about Spirited Away and brought it home for us to watch in, I want to say, mid-2002. So in other words, I first watched this movie when I was five years old. Kinda makes a lot more sense now, doesn't it? The movie starts with a young girl named Chihiro moving to a new home. It's fun to move to a new place. It's an adventure. Spoken like someone who's never moved their own furniture. Try saying that again when you got a whole ass couch on your back. Oh boy, what an adventure! They get lost and wind up at this tunnel, and rather than turn around and go back like any reasonable person would do, they decide to go inside and explore. Come on, let's go in. I want to see what's on the other side. I'm not going! It gives me the creeps! Yeah, you and me both, Chihiro! Now, as I've mentioned in my previous entries, the feeling that something was awry was often scary enough to creep me out before anything scary actually happened. And even before anything really occurs in the plot, this movie does a great job at setting up an eerie atmosphere. There's nothing inherently scary about some grassy hills and a bright blue sky. What, is that scary to you? It looks like the Windows XP wallpaper. It's pretty. But the movie manages to make it creepy, with the pacing feeling like it's out of an avant-garde thriller or something. Chihiro's parents stumble upon an abandoned restaurant that for some reason is stocked with hot food, and rather than question why, they decide to start eating. These two would be the first people to die in a horror movie. 
Then this other kid appears and he's like, get out of here, it's almost night! Despite it having been the middle of the day just a second ago. But then it is night, like half a second later, these bizarre shadow creatures start appearing everywhere. And right when you think things couldn't get any weirder, her parents turn into pigs! Now, as an adult, this symbolism is fairly obvious. Maybe a bit heavy-handed, even. Since their parents were acting gluttonous and stupid, so they were fittingly turned into brainless pigs. But when I was five, I wasn't thinking about any of that. All I was thinking was... Oh my god, her parents turned into pigs! Uh, can parents do that? How is that even possible? Oh god, what if my parents turned into pigs too? Mom? Dad? Are you alright? Please don't turn into pigs! Ah! Ah! And it only got worse from there on out. This movie is an absolute fever dream of the trippiest kind. Every scene introduces something new to screw with your brain. Chihiro decides to run, but finds out that there's suddenly a friggin' river blocking her way. It wasn't there before. And then she starts disappearing. The implication that you could slowly fade away from existence and not be able to do anything about it was certainly the source of a few nightmares after watching this. After a brief talk with Dr. Robotnik over here, she goes to this witch lady named Yubaba, who, surprise surprise, is also freaky as hell. Tell me, Mr. Anderson, what good is a phone call if you're unable to speak? Chihiro has to work for you, Baba, but in doing so, gets her name shortened to Sen. When I was a kid, I thought they were calling her Sin, but apparently this is a reference to the Japanese letter for Sen being half of the phrase for Chihiro, with Sen meaning 1000. So essentially, they've given her a number and taken away her name. I am not a number. I am a free man. Of course, I didn't get any of this as a kid and just thought it was freaky. Especially after she nearly forgets her name at one point. Like, how do you forget your own name? She gets assigned the hardest work, is harassed by her co-workers, and by the way, all this work she's doing is unpaid. Don't worry though, it's not child slavery, it's just an internship. All the while encountering weird spirits, like this giant stink spirit and this other one called No Face. He actually has a face, or at least a mouth, but don't worry about it. Unless he eats you, then yeah, you should be worried. Then she meets a giant baby! If you go, I'll cry, and Mama will hear me, and Mama will come in here and kill you. Play with me or I'll break your arm. I loathed this giant baby back then. You know, watching this movie has answered a few questions for me. For a good chunk of my childhood, I hated babies, and none of my family or teachers could figure out why. Even I didn't know why, I just knew I hated them. Well, between this and the friggin' demon baby from Tin Toy, I think I just figured it out. I don't remember much else about the movie freaking me out back then. Where is he? The movie does have a happy ending. Chihiro passes the test, the boy turns out to be a river spirit who saved her life years back, Chihiro goes home, and five-year-old me has nightmares for a week. There's a reason I put this film at number one! It's another one of those movies with a unique atmosphere. It fully immerses you into the world, making you believe you truly are there, while also making you want to get away from there as soon as possible. You're in awe of it, but you're also terrified of it. It's the type of movie that, if you're young enough, may haunt you for a while afterwards, as it did with me. I was legit scared of anime for eight years after this. Seriously, I'd go out of my way to avoid watching anime, a precedent that continued until I was 13. And I haven't revisited Spirited Away since then. It was only this year, for this video, that I built up the courage to finally rewatch it and conquer my fear of a wholesome, heartwarming children's film. And yeah, for the record, I did really enjoy it this time. Ghibli's charm is in full effect with this movie. It has gorgeous animation, a beautiful score, and good writing all around. And while it's not my favorite Miyazaki film I've seen, I'd still recommend everyone check it out if you somehow haven't already. Just don't show it to your five-year-old. Well, that's the list. Do you have any films that scared you as a kid? Leave them down in the comments below, and I'll catch you next time. Bob Saget! That was a perfect take. Oh my god. Wow, holy crap guys, I passed over a thousand subscribers. 
thanks so much to all of you for subscribing and helping me out on this channel. I didn't think I would get to this point, at least not this soon. I wasn't planning on this, but I might just have to make a 1000 subscriber special at some point. I don't know, let me know if you're interested in this. Otherwise, I'll see you guys in my next video.